Hey everyone, welcome back to But Why Though the podcast, where we talk about the things in pop culture that people say matter and ask the question, but why though? Make sure you head over to our Facebook, facebook.com slash but why though PC, and our Twitter on Instagram, at but why though PC. We definitely want to get more involved with you all, and we want to hear your fan but why those. Let us know. We'll put it up on the website. Also, if you want to support us a little bit more, head on over to our Patreon. There you'll get access to all of our research notes, early released episodes, as well as a whole bunch of stuff that I cut out from the episode. So if you want extra content, go ahead and head over there. And if you subscribe at the $3 level, you also get some merch. I am in the process of sending stuff out to people right now, and I'm looking to get more stuff done. But if a monthly subscription is just too much, we also have some t-shirts. Go ahead and get one, send us your picture in it, and we'll post it up on our website. But we here at But Why Though want you to know that just you listening is as important as it gets. So share us with your friends, share us with your grandma, share us with whoever you can. Play us while you're at work and make your entire place listen to us. We appreciate it and we love you guys. Today we're talking a video game franchise that's been around since 2007. We're talking Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed. As always, I'm your host Kate and I'm here with Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And Matt. Hello. We're going to start with a question. Have you played any of the Assassin's Creed games and are you excited for the new one releasing? I played Assassin's Creed 2 and then when it was free on Xbox, I played Black Flag. (laughs) That's about it. (laughs) Yeah. So, and am I excited for the new one? I don't know. I it's so hard to keep track of the story, and I don't know if I'll get the story. So, I think at I'm this point us- it might not matter whether you get the other. <laughs> yeah. So I'm using this as a. I'm counting on Matt to tell me if I want to keep playing these games or not. Um. So for me, I played part. I've, I've played parts of a lot of them. I think I almost beat Brotherhood. But I didn't play anything past three, because technically three is after Brotherhood, right? No. No? Okay. Revelations is after Oh, Brotherhood. Revelations after Brotherhood. Okay. So I have I, them literally written. Oh, they are right in front of me. That would probably help. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I didn't make it to three. I played part of one, almost all of two, almost all of Brotherhood, and then didn't touch Revelations, even though I have it, and then never got to three. And a lot of that was just, like, it. the reason I didn't finish one was just because I realized I was spending, like, hours just walking around not doing anything related to anything. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to put this down and come back to it later and never ended up coming back. Um, as for the new one, as for being excited, I'm probably not going to play it. I have, obviously, I haven't played all the Assassin's Creed games, but I'm kind of excited for what it can be used as like an education tool for like digi- digital humanities stuff to like bring the digital world into the education world and kind of bridge that. So I like anything that gives me a tool to do that, which I know some people who have written on using Assassin's Creed to teach history and to teach religion. So um, that's kind of what I'm excited for. Yeah, so we'll probably talk, I guess, a little bit more in depth about the last game, I guess, and what it could bring and how it's going to be, I guess, supposedly revamping the series. But as far as what all I've played... So I played everything up to Black Flag, and then pretty much played a little bit of Black Flag. And then, as we'll go and discuss later, there are plenty of reasons why I quit playing these series, even though this used to be one of my favorite series, especially when it was first released back in 07. And moved on. Yeah, so before we get into the meat of the conversation, I did want to ask a question I heard on what we talk about when we talk about um, our friend Alex's podcast who was on here for our screen episode. Um, they did an Assassin's Creed episode and they asked, what historical figure do you think was an assassin? And I just think that's an awesome question and I kind of want to know what you all think. Uh, so when I was asked, asked this question pre-show, um, I wasn't sure if I should pick someone alive or dead. Uh, I guess it's kind of hard to like argue that historical figures now are historical figures if they're still alive, but I'm fully convinced that Joe Biden is an assassin. <laughs> uh, I want and, that so bad. And for dead historical figures, I'm going to have to go with Tesla being an assassin because he was just too 
too ahead of his time. And there's time travel stuff, so, you know, why not? Pretty good duo right there. So Tesla actually is part, if you look in the in-depth part of their universe or background of it, I'm not 100% sure whether he was actually an assassin, but I think ahead of his time was because of what we'll get in later, one of the relic artifacts that he had, I believe, came in possession of. Called it. I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> At least from remember from reading some of the lore. Matt has Chris Pine, you have Tesla. <laughs> End of episode. Adelita is in the Mexican Revolution where, like, the female soldiers, and her name was Petra, but she went by Pedro, and she fought for Pancho Villa in the revolution, and then Pancho Villa refused to give her credit for winning one of, like, the big deciding battles, and so she just, like, said deuces and, like, formed her own regiment and became one of the most legendary female figures in, like, Mexican revolutionary history, and I was going through like the list of assassins, and I didn't notice that there was that there were any Mexicans on there. So I'm gonna throw um, uh, Pedro Herrera in the ring because uh, I think she was a badass. And as for alive, I don't think I can think of anybody who would be an assassin because I feel like we're in a world of Templars right now, and it's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> if you want me to be entirely honest, I'm gonna shoot this over to Matt now. So I guess the problem I have is because I've, of course, been a little while since, uh, obviously, because the, the series. I, it's hard for me to, like, answer this question only because I know how many people that actually involve in history throughout these games to be either, like, one side or the other, even if they weren't either directly or indirectly, as I kind of pointed out with Tesla, where I can't remember, but he was obviously there. Also, I don't have much time to think about this as you two. <laughs> <laughs> I told you this when I was listening to their episode in the car. Yeah, well, things happen. <laughs> naps um, happen huh naps happen yes naps happen because <laughs> if i had to say anybody i would have probably went with like he said with tesla <laughs> as well if i had to think of anybody off the top of my head and i'm also not a giant history buff so that doesn't help me at all <laughs> i don't honestly couldn't tell you besides basically probably going with somewhat of the realm of like tesla honestly i guess if i could go with anybody if i wanted to pick a scientist i could pick one of the top scientists especially the way they go now Ooh. Bill Nye, the assassin guy. Well, not him. You probably wouldn't pick him, but I think... That's my my live person. Bill Nye, the assassin guy. There we go. No, if uh, if you want to pick a historical one, I mean, it could be interesting to see with Carl Sagan and how much he actually did. Yeah, this is true. So. But that's what I'm going to go with my answer for that question. Carl Sagan? Yes. So our assassins are Joe Biden, Tesla, uh, Pedro... Carl Sagan, and Bill Nye the Assassin Guy. There you go. Works for me. (laughs) Okay, so I am now going to switch the reins over to somebody who is well-versed in the Assassin's Creed world. I don't know what term to give you. Am I handing you the Apple of Eden? No. Does that work? No? No? Sure. Yes? I'll take that. We could do a lot with that, but then it'd be wrong. (laughs) So, as Kate had said, this franchise began in 2007 by Ubisoft being the publisher, Ubisoft, or Ubisoft, however you'd like to, and Ubisoft Montreal being the main one, obviously, that did most of all these single-player games, and then because of how many games grew in the series, basically, you could literally take Ubisoft, insert whatever development part of developer they have, or, I guess, company, whatnot, and you could probably get it right, because there's so many... <laughs> I think. So the gameplay and the game design were basically based off of two things, taking the concepts of the old Prince of Persia series, where basically there's climbing, jumping, and running the way the action scenes flow, and if you've ever played any old uh, Prince of Persia. And then it's also inspired, at least the first one initially, by a book of Alamut? Alamut? Alamut. Alamut. Which is basically where they get the entire whole, as they call it, Assassin's actual creed from. Which is based on Ismaili Islam. So, the more you know. Yeah. (laughs) As far as what came out, basically this game was pretty much on every platform. It started on the basically 360 and PS3, worked its in Wii, and we worked its way to the Wii, Xbox One, PS4, PC. And then when you start getting to the other spin-off games and everything, it literally goes into the PlayStation Vita, if anybody remembers what that is. The (laughs) DS, Androids, iOS, even a Windows phone. Uh, mainly these are all the spin-offs and mobile games. I think there's even a Facebook game at one time that you could play. 
But as far as what we have, we have basically nine main games, ten including what the which we'll talk about a little more. And we kind of mentioned in the beginning the new one being released. Um, I believe it's October twenty seventh of this month, twenty seventeen, and then a nine additional spinoffs, and then obviously various DLCs and random things. We probably won't actually go into that into any of those games, which I've heard they kind of add a lot to the lore and background. But they really, as far as the main story in general, that I've enjoyed for this series, uh, they. And they might add some to it, but not actually much, as far as I know. Like I said, they just, they're just they basically extras. Money grabs, eventually, what Ubisoft turned this into. So I'll start off with the first one, 2007, Assassin's Creed 1. Then 2009, Assassin's Creed 2. Uh, then, obviously, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood in 2010. Assassin's Creed Revelations, 2011. Assassin's Creed 3, 2012. This is about when we start seeing a pattern, if anybody <laughs> realized how the first two we had some spacing. We we'll kind of can look at the Metacritic and when I finish this real fast, so you can also see another pattern. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag in 2013. There's actually two games in 2014 of Assassin's Creed Rogue and Unity. And then apparently Assassin's Creed Syndicate came out in 2015. I actually didn't know this game existed for a I while. I didn't know Rogue existed. <laughs> they all kind of whatever they they're just a little clunk cluster of thing as you can see they also went to a uh, new name naming type things that kind of that was just a little bit what they've kind of done and then obviously assassin's creed origin in 2017 as far as like the actual metacritic of these games the first one was an 81 it was basically kind of not really groundbreaking, but it's like a novel of its time, but basically there were a lot of problems and repetitiveness of why I could totally see. And then you have Assassin's Creed 2 is a 91, and then Brotherhood 90, which are pretty much the pinnacle peak of this entire series, at least obviously in my opinion, and obviously somewhat in the Metacritic story. And then Revelations was an 80, 3 was an 85, Black Flag was an 88, and then we get to the fun ones of 72, 70, 70. Six <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of other problems that go. So that was just a brief like how the games are. As far as what we're gonna talk about, I want to talk about the main story because the way these games are broken down into essentially they have two main storylines. You have an ancestor storyline, which is when you're in the Animus, which I'll kind of explain for, in a second, and then you have like basically a modern day storyline. So this game starts out with, basically, it revolves around two, I guess, ancient secret societies called the Assassins and the Knight Templars, or short, basically, the Templars. And in modern day, they're basically a mega corporation under the name of Abstergo, which they create a device called the Animus, which basically allows users or test subjects to relive their ancestral lives by using their genetic material. So basically, you get hooked up or you go into this... Uh, in some way, depending on how they depict it. I think each game depicts it differently, and even the movie, which thing, they depict it even different. And so what they do is basically they either kidnap or they have uh, people they believe have these ancestral genes or match their ancestors back to the assassins, and they basically hook them up to this machine, and basically they go into the new world. And that's where they have this whole, like, you're now an assassin. So it was actually a very interesting concept. It was totally something, at the time, totally different and new, especially if you played the first one and you saw, like, all the previews and you saw all these, like, ancient Damascus and Jerusalem and uh, the actual main character, and then you start the game off with, and it's like you're in a uh, city uh, high, uh, skyscraper, and you're like, what is going on? Did I buy the wrong game? So it took a little while to actually figure out what was um, going on for a second. And so, like I said, I'm going to talk about the one part. So I'm going to look at basically the modern day story with a little bit of sprinkles of the actual assassin stories, which are throughout each game are kind of their own thing, with the modern story being an overlay of the entire thing. And this basically runs from Assassin's Creed 1 through Assassin's Creed 3. And then after that, it kind of just dies or sprinkles. <laughs> it's not really mentioned it's somewhat in moderation of whatnot. Whew. Everybody's still caught up with me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, so, so basically, the first one we'll start with the main character from the like the main character assassin from the first uh, Assassin's Creed one through three because they only end up being actual three people. 
And the first one from the first game is Altair during the Third Crusade, which at this point I'm going to allow Kate to say the actual full name because she's been dying to this and she's basically <laughs> looking at me like, I want to do this really bad. So I'll let you say the actual name of Altair. I don't get to speak Arabic anymore. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, Altair Ibn al -Ahad. I thought that was going to be more, like, no, kind of anticlimactic. No, it's just that. So. I know. I, I just, I haven't gotten to pronounce anything correctly in a long time. <laughs> and then moving, what... yeah. <laughs> and so this was taking place during the Third Crusade. And then there's the second one. So basically, Assassin's Creed II, Brotherhood and Revolution, they kind of move into the Renaissance area. And basically, this is kind of the story of Ezio, which you can go for that name. Ezio Oratori de Firenze. Which they say that throughout the entire game, and it sounds so awesome, whoever actually does the <laughs> voice acting. I'm not going to, I cannot pronounce that properly, so definitely not going to try. But these three games essentially revolve around his entire life. You show the growth of, basically his growth, and I think the, the end, yeah, excuse me, the last one ends up basically with him like as an old man. And it shows actually building of an assassin organization. They kind of do a lot of things of like actually, as it says, brotherhood, where you actually start recruiting a new assassin, and they kind of show the growth of the actual organization. Even though in the third, even though in the first game, there actually shows there is a brotherhood already, but I guess in this one, they want to enhance the actual growth of, at least during this time frame of the new assassins. Well, I mean, it would make sense too during the Renaissance, because during the Renaissance, you have this like, flourishing of knowledge that happens mm -hmm. in Italy. So based on like what the assassins are, it would make sense that there's more people to actually go to them. Yeah, and I know at least by the end of the first one, usually I, I can't speak for everything, but a lot of the people I guess I can say spoiler for 2000 for 10 years worth. Uh, basically the leader or the head of the at least for the person that yeah, at least for the part of the brotherhood you're at is actually ends up being a bad guy, so I'm assuming a lot of oh. them die <laughs> <laughs> during the time this betrayal and throughout history so yeah that i can totally see that and then assassin's creed 3 moving in the colonial period you are connor which that's all i'm gonna say and kate can totally say the actual name of this oh so this one i might mess up because i do not know indigenous american languages like at all i'm not gonna pretend like i do but i did look up the scholarly pronunciation um of the uh uh Kaha language which is mohawk for English listeners, because uh, he's a Mohawk native. Um, it's uh, uh, Radun Hagedun, I think. Yeah, Radun Hagedun. But they, like, say it completely. Like, they have different people say it differently throughout the game. And so, like, the best thing I could find on the, on the, on the Ubisoft forum was somebody saying, like, well, this is how you pronounce it, like, phonetically as per, like, scholarly reports on the language and stuff like because that. Because of this is why they call, he changes his name to Connor. And so those are basically the characters you play through for this whole entire, uh, for this whole, like, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> So these are the assassins you play for, play with for the basically the inner animus storylines for the first few games, and then basically you have these modern day characters, which is through this modern day storyline, which all bleeds together to go when they are known as Desmond Miles, which is also known as Subject Seventeen. In the first game, basically you find out he's been kidnapped by Abstergo. He's basically the modern day that you find out eventually he's a modern day assassin. He basically he. You actually find out later in the series he actually knows of this war, but he apparently runs away because he didn't want to be a part of it and becomes just a bartender in a random town before he finally... I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly if they find out how they catch him, but yeah, that's how he becomes there. Uh, Lucy Stillman, which is the biggest gripe I have of this entire, I guess, storyline and even... I, I could say series because I don't count the last three at this point, but of this thing. Basically, she is an assassin who infiltrates Abstergo to then help Desmond, who then becomes a traitor to Desmond, who then helps, besides saving Desmond's life not once, but saving Desmond's life multiple times and getting him out, and then basically relieving, breaking him out, which apparently was an entire plan. Then he, she is now working for the Templars in the end, and then they kill her. Somehow, some way, it's... You know why? Why? Because they can't animate women. 
They man her. She's right off of Kristen Bell. And actually funny because <laughs> uh, when I found that, I was like, damn, she did look like Kristen Bell. <laughs> well, I'm just saying this is right around the time when they said that it was it was too costly to animate women. This is not the time when Isn't that happened. It? No, this it's is after well, though. This is well before that time. Thought it was. When she they dies first... in the third game. Isn't the third game like after Brotherhood and Revelations? The third game is Brotherhood. Oh, I thought this was in three three. No, 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 no. She don't make it a three three. Okay. <laughs> See, this is com- this is why talking about Assassin's Creed is really confusing for me because the third game is not Assassin's Creed three. So, like you would assume. This is why <laughs> this whole storyline that I'm talking about basically Assassin's Creed one, two, and three are to progress mostly this storyline. Okay. With Brotherhood and Revelations, the time <clears throat> money grabs. But they end up being a really great game to progress Ezio's actual story with a little bit of progression of actual Desmond's story. Okay, so, because if you have not played the games, listeners, and Adrian, just so I can get this straight, this is all the same subject, right, in the Animus, but the Ezio storyline that I hear so much about is only from two to Revelations. I think they bring him up, and I believe you get to see him... I don't remember if it's three or Black Flag, but you see him as an old man, as re- already retired at one time in the other game. Okay. But but yes, for his storyline, basically it's those. Okay. Yeah, the entire reason why I don't play these games anymore is because when Black Flag came out for free on Xbox for gold, it's like it's okay. I I can catch up, right? I can just <laughs> go back and watch like a thirty minute YouTube video of the story, and no, I couldn't. Because it's crazy. <laughs> so if I'm quiet, it's because I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in this story. Yeah. I feel like if for our listeners you've heard our Sailor Moon episode, I feel like Matt during the Sailor Moon episode, it just sounds crazy and I don't know yeah. what's going on. So I'm trying to get all the main characters out of here as fast as possible and then I'm gonna basically just knock out the entire story in about a five minute okay. monologue. I just thought it was important to say that, that that was Ubisoft's justification for not having a lot of female characters. That and was only in characters. multiplayer. Okay. Yeah. They, okay. They, they, playable female characters. I think she dies as they introduce multiplayer. So, yeah, because they can't animate women. Yeah. I am justified. Uh Uh-huh. But, yes. Anyways, so other side characters we meet is William Miles, which is Desmond's dad, which you end up finding out he's obviously an assassin and pretty much, I believe, the the head of the Assassin Brotherhood. Rebecca Crane and Sean Hastings, which are basically, like, team members in tech support. Sean Hastings is actually just a historian who actually kind of, like, stumbles upon this and they actually recruit him in. And so it's just kind of notable because there's very few people who are actually recruited at this point who don't have, like, bloodline of some sort. And those are assassins yes. or Templar? Okay, These are all assassins. assassins. Okay. I didn't really mention any Templar names. I could do it, but, I mean, one, I they I feel like pretty that's much, getting us off and do a whole One, they always, thing. pretty much they all die somewhat, but, yeah. And then Clay, <laughs> you want to try to say this last name for me? I don't get down with those, with those European Cosmark. names. Cosmark. Cosmark? Uh, Kaxmeric? Casmeric sounds great. Yeah, Casmeric. Anyways, he ends up being Subject 16. He's dead before you find out he's dead already by the time you get it. That's why you're now Subject 17, along with all the other 15 who before you who are also dead. We don't know how them, but he ends up being important. He basically went in, insane and couldn't separate the personalities from the people inside, from the animus from inside himself because they have this thing which is called the bleeding effect where every time you go in there, you sink your DNA and your mind with these, your ancestors, in which, A, you kind of start learning their abilities. So that's how, basically, Desmond ends up becoming a full assassin. But too much exposure to this bleeding effect, basically your brain starts to split. So, I mean, like, it's super easy. Oh. Yes. He's he's Assassin Hulk? <laughs> he's sure. too, much gamma, too much gamma radiation? Yeah. I don't know if they expose you to gamma radiation, but whatever they do to you in that animus. I was going to equate it to Barry jumping timelines and staying in one timeline and forgetting his former self because one timeline cementing and the other is erasing. That's probably closer, except there's not two timelines. It's well, one in well, timeline. Yeah. But anyway, so he commits suicide, basically went insane. He Then you learn that he ends up helping Desmond in later games within the animus. So basically he... Basically rewrote programming and left clues throughout, and his actual personality basically split within the animus. Uh, so those are your main characters for this. I'm going to basically do a monologue of this entire storyline to go through this, but 
Can yeah. I do like a little song? No. Please? No. Story time with Matt. Adrian's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this whole entire battle revolves around between the Assassins and Templar starts re- revolves around these basically what are called pieces of Eden or relics and eventually lead to this entire piece of Eden to form an Apple of Eden, which is based upon whether you to control humanity through basically using these apples or whether humanity gets free will, which we'll go into more depth later. But this is what all this revolves around. So we start with basically Assassin's Creed 1. You start as a third, third crusade, you start with Altair, and Desmond you find out about Abstergo. He goes through this entire game, through all the old Damascus, Jerusalem. I don't remember the, I think Mascif. I believe it's the Old Brotherhood. I don't remember the actual name. It's M-A-S-F something. You kill all these people and you come to find out. He finally finds at the end the Apple of Eden. You find out his actual mentor or leader thing wants to control the world. And basically tells you no. You end up killing him. You take the Eden. You move on. Go to Assassin's Creed 2. Basically during this time, right before you get to 2, this is where Desmond finds out that basically about Subject 16, because he has all his blood stains written, on the wall, which he sees through what is called eagle vision, which is a somewhat way of like in heightening your senses to be able to see random either ways of getting away things and people. I don't know exactly a good way of actually explaining it. I don't know an actual. I'm good way. thinking of when Bran goes into a crow in Game of Thrones, like a warg, where like they put their consciousness into a crow and look at everything. But you don't do that, though. You well, I'm just saying that that's what's going into my head. Okay. I know that's not what, it, what, what you're doing, but I'm thinking of a war. <laughs> so at the end of the game, you find out that basically Desmond, or that Clay, which you don't even know at this time, you know him at sub-16, left basically a bunch of blood written all over the thing saying, Desmond, you need to get out, and there's a prophecy coming, and it, basically for 2012. And so at this point, Lucy saves you, go whatever, bam. Assassin's Creed 2. You start the game out with, basically, you're in the same area. Lucy breaks you out, because apparently at this time she's still a good person. You know, breaks you out. You break out. You go to, uh, basically, one of the old temple, or, or, excuse me, assassin places. Apparently, it's part of Project Siren that she con- con- yeah, colluded with some of the Templars to basically help you put your mind at ease, because obviously the more you go in, the better to help this thing. So Assassin's Creed 2, you take up uh, Ezio's storyline in the Renaissance. You basically play through the entire thing, killing all the Borgias and other things of their corruption. Basically, you play through that whole storyline. Desmond and them really does not, um, doesn't really have much in here. They kind of progress, like I said, a little bit. He still get part of this bleeding effect, so he's only had a, basically a little bit of transition of skills going through. And this game ends with probably one of the most awesome cliffhangers, or not cliffhangers, but like shockers for me. In which he goes and um, you learn about, as I said, the 2012 prophecies, this ancient civilization, which are basically these, the people that they call it, the people who came before, which I think they're called the Itsu. The Isu. Or Isu, which takes a lot of background knowledge and finding, decrypting all these like glyphs they have throughout the game, just like doing random things to find out more about them. Or two hours reading the Wikipedia. Or two hours reading the Wikipedia. That's how people. long I spent. Yeah. The mythology is actually so you, really freaking cool in this world. Yeah. So you find out about these people who came before, who apparently created who created humanity, enslaved humanity, controlled, and whatnot. And so the game ends with, one, you're getting this piece of, uh, this apple of Eden as Ezio. You're met by, I believe it's Minervir? Minerva? Minerva, yes. Because basically there's three head people of Jupiter, Juno, and Miner- Minerva. 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 Which Juno, you, know, you find out, is a bad person. Well, anyways, at the thing, you're talking to her, she hands this thing, and literally as your Ezio, she says, Desmond, you need this to basically think, which basically says, start talking to actual Desmond, in which you're sitting there, you're like, what the hell happened because you're not happened because you're not Desmond anymore. But obviously, this is all for tale, so they know that Desmond's already in this animus. It was definitely one of the most crazy, what the hell just happened moments and whatnot. And so that's how that game ends. So the game just ends with that going, Desmond, even though you're talking to Ezio, your time will come. We need your help. You must make a choice to save the world. And you're like, what the? And like I said, they get broken out. They leave. And so on. You go to, basically, they move on to Brotherhood. Brotherhood was the first game, like I said. They didn't really extend on this story of Desmond so much as more of Ezio's growth. So you, once again, take up the thing of Ezio. You play through the entire thing, moving, progressing along. 
one of the best part about these whole three is your best friend is like Leonardo da Vinci. That's awesome. And so he helps you with a lot of stuff. So as far as the main storyline, you go through, you end up in a cave, you find out Ezio, or excuse me, yeah, yeah, Ezio shows you where you've, he's hidden his piece of apple or eating or whatnot. So you go to that part to unlock it. Bam, as you get it to unlock, basically at the very end, Juno takes over your body. And this basically where you take your blade and she controls you to stab um, Lucy and kill Lucy. Which, by the way, audience, uh, about a week leading up to this episode, every time Matt thought about the notes he was making, he just went on like a 30 minute to hour rant about how he hated this point in the game and how they did such a disservice to Lucy. Did. She was basically, she was, like I said, she was, beside Desmond, basically the main character throughout one of the the first two games and even the third game in the storyline. She basically helped you do everything. She broke you out, she saved you, all this other stuff. Because basically, Gino says only one person permitted through the gate. You're not allowed to have basically uh, betrayers through the gate. You don't really understand. You stab them. Go. I'm not really giving any backstory information because this is literally all the information they give you in the game. <laughs> <laughs> so you're trying to keep up, and this is what made the game so great at the beginning. Is you had basically they left you on these hangers and trying to figure anything out. So you end up going on forums and having to read all the backdrop and all the lore to figure out exactly what's going on. So because of this trauma of you killing Lucy, you fall into a coma. Basically, your dad shows up. So you start the next game. This is where Clay comes in the picture and basically kind of in some sort of form pops out. Basically says, you guys need to put him in the Animus. His, he needs to fully sync with Ezio and Altair to get his mind back from this crashing of the coma. From killing Lucy, they throw him in the Animus. And basically, you spend the whole game in Revelations in the Animus for the most part, fixing all this stuff until you eventually go at the very end Desmond fully sinks he's now assassin of modern day assassino yeah I just I have that the the movie in my head yeah (laughs) modern day in the game and you go through play through all Ezio stuff this was more this was probably out of one of them probably one of the not the later one but within the storyline definitely a money grab of just continuing the story because they had nothing to do other than they put him in coma. In the end of the game, you end up going, I think, to the Colosseum, I believe it is, to find the parts of the vaults at the very end. While while you're there. Okay. Then you get to Assassin's Creed Creed. Assassin's Creed Creed. Oh my god, we're still on Assassin's Creed? No, this is the very last one. Of oh, this. wait, no, because you were on Revolution. Okay. Yeah, so now god, we get to Assassin's Creed. damn game naming system <laughs> is... Assassin's Creed 3, that you end up moving to the Colonial. Which is really 5. Yeah, which is technically 5 at this point. <laughs> And so you end up going, you take over Connor, you basically play through this whole Native American, you basically help save the American Revolution and whatnot. So basically you save George Washington's life and other people to turn the battle from the Templars. And they actually have, isn't it the Charles Lee in there as a Templar? Who yes. Who's an actual historical character who yes. actually hated George yes. Washington? Yes. Which so that's a fun story if you yeah. look up the actual history. So you spend that. most yeah, so you spend half pretty much most of the game. This story is not as well as far as Connor's, I guess, played out compared to some of the other ones, because then you play a lot with Desmond in this game. In which they find out the Templars on the trail, they go, they kidnap you're starting down the rest of the pieces of Ah, Eden. You basically your dad goes off to try to find one piece, you go off to find the other ones, they kidnap your dad, you find this, you go to Abstergo, you just kill everybody in Abstergo, rescue your dad, and I think this is about time when you learn that Lucy, I believe, was your double, triple agent part. And so it comes back to you finally unlock to use the apples, you find the vault, and basically you get to the end. To where now this is basically twenty December twenty first, twenty twelve, which is basically if you were alive during that time, you know of the I believe it's Notre Dame and the lining of the end of the world. No, Pro- it, it, yeah, it was Notre Dame, which was mapped onto yeah. the yeah. Mayan calendar, yeah. which somehow was also its own prophecy. But the Notre Dame had a prophecy. Well, it kind of like, like aligned with that one, or something. It some was way. a whole it was bunch. Weird... It was a whole bunch of really freaked out Americans taking all these not American things and making them into one thing. It's actually pretty fun to read. I haven't done it in 10 years, obviously, but it was actually pretty fun and interesting to look up. No, it is super interesting. It's just like it's actually really stupid when you actually start looking at the calendar end. It's like, well, yeah. Anyways, you get to the (laughs) vault. You unlock the vault. This is where all your three ancient civilization people show up. It's who... And basically, they're told the prosperity that uh, basically a solar flare, which destroyed their civilization a long time ago, had destroyed the Earth and all the people there. 
Basically, the solar flare is going to happen and basically kill the Earth again. And you have basically two choices at Desmond. Within this thing, you can use this, use the apple, basically put this protecting globe around or blob or whatever the heck you want to call it. Or aura around the uh, Earth, you protect the Earth from the solar flare, you save everybody. But in doing so, you basically release Juno's captivity, which they basically... Or enabled her to basically come back to take um, rule of the world. But, because you find out that Juno was a bad person, she wanted to enslave and control humanity to the fullest, not just like the way they did before. And so to do this, they made this uh, device. One, so they kind of were out, but they made this device to save the world because they were the only three people in the simulations to try to basically stop the solar flare at this time, which they couldn't. By the time they did, when they did it, they said, well, we'll entrap Juno with it. Juno wrote a uh, basically an encryption in the in the Eden when it's used that basically she is now released to then become I guess not necessarily reincarnated but basically find a body or somewhat and so Desmond decides to save the world by sacrificing himself dying saves the world but then quote unquote releases Juno blah blah that is basically the rough about as quick as you can say story of that. Bum, bum, bum. And while that's was fun and interesting, we tried to talk about when the but why those more in depth of that stuff. Then we go to Black Flag, which literally has nothing to do <laughs> with any of this. It's now that Desmond's dead. Essentially, you become a random person. There's some sprinkles in this of uh, this actual storyline because obviously you find out that Juno's husband has taken human form throughout the years and basically called a sage and trying to basically release Juno into human form or whatever. That kind of happens a little bit of the game, but as far as that, it's not. There's nothing else there. Black Flag is rated one of the best games. Probably why Adrian, I'm assuming, enjoyed the story or played the game. I played most of it. Yeah. I'll be perfectly frank and honest. I hate sneaking games. So... <laughs> I like, I play the first one more for like the historical aspect. I'm a history major, so I like the history aspect of it. But as far as like gameplay, I hate sneaking. I just want to kill stuff as like a, I don't know. <laughs> that I just want to kill stuff. May, that also may be why I never finished a game. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I, I just didn't finish it. And because like like you said, there, all the stuff I looked up to go into playing Black Flag, didn't really matter yeah, or like didn't with. connect to anything i i like spent three hours like reading and looking at youtube videos for and i was like well this do these games even have any continuity anymore so yeah basically the only reason this is rated as one of the best and most fun games overall is because they actually kind of fine-tune the gameplay by this point obviously it's really fun to play with the gameplay the story from actual uh I believe you play as connor's grandfather edward is actually pretty good you get to be a pirate and you captain a ship and so, I mean, as far as all that aspect as a standalone game, it was great. But as you take it into the concept of where it went to the series, there's literally nothing more than this guy named John who's tech support at Abstergo, who's a sage who tries to kill you, who dies. <laughs> and then you pretty much die, or they don't even say what happened to you. It's funny that, like, I mean, it's not funny, because, like, obviously, like, I guess, like, Desmond's story is the one continuous thread throughout all the games, but I was old, I was more intrigued by the historical story and the story of, like, the assassin in his historical period versus Desmond's story when I was playing. Well, th that one's fun because, what are we like said, it, it'll end up breaking back from ancient civil, you have, you basically a combination of ancient civilizations, you have basically this whole birth of humanity part of this, this basically rebellion by humanity against its ancient civilizations, the destruction of the world of extinctions. Basically, you have power, and then you have... Um, <laughs> Do you mean, like, the, the modern story? Like, that's ultimately what it is? Yeah, so basically okay. these two people to find out to get these pieces of Adam and whatnot, basically, they're, basically, like I said, they're ancient, the people that came before, they basically rewrote their genetic mm -hmm. code and your whole evolution and all the genetics that they have triple helix DNA instead of double helix DNA and whatnot. So they're a little more, they have six senses instead of five. And they're giants. Giants, like, yeah. And so you have a little bit of that sprinkled out how they get to this whole point. You have a 2012 prophecy to go about to the yeah. whole thing. No, no, I get it. I, I, I see the appeal of Desmond's story. I wasn't saying that it was less. Yeah. I was just saying that, like... I found myself, I guess, because, like, Adrian, like, I love history. I found myself more, like, I want to do more assassiny things versus right. 
caring so much about Desmond. Right. But I think because I went in with that mentality, I kind of didn't let myself get too much into that. Where now, when you like gave us the recap of the mythology and stuff, I'm like, damn, I kind of needed to get in on that. Yeah. Like I said, if you pull, if you looked at all the promos and everything, you literally start the game in a skyscraper. You get a little confused. Yeah. And so then, after Black Flag, it basically, we just, people don't even know these games exist, but since we have Rogue, Unity, Syndicate. Oh, I know Unity exists. Two of them exist. I mean, two <laughs> of them came out in the same year. You literally become Initiate. You just enter. It's almost like a gaming device. The Arc Dergrove made. You enter the Animus. You play an Assassin's Story. Well, I mean, it's There's technically always, no... it's technically always been like a gaming type device. If yeah, you but it's literally, it. you're just initiative. There's no actual backstory to this. There's no, you don't even get a name of the person in the Animus. You're just So a blank this screen. one really is a game within a game versus the other yeah. ones. Or you it's mind time travel. Most of the time at the end of the game, you find out somewhat backstory about the Templars and Assassins. And I mean, one of them literally ends with the game going, do you join the Templars or die? And then the game cuts out. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure they kill you in one of the other ones. That's yeah. it. There's no actual thing. You don't have a name or anything. So they suck. Yeah. Okay. So getting to the but why, though, is now that we did that so much. <laughs> Obviously, it's a success- yeah, successful franchise. It's one of a handful of franchises that have sold over 100 million copies to date, which may seem, one, it's great, and depending on how many games they did, but coming out compared to a lot of, when I looked this up, it, I found it fascinating because from a time-wise standpoint, this game started in 2007. And so, really, if you look at games that started around either, like, even maybe early 2000s or even this area, there's only three games that even come to close to, like, copies sold. That's Minecraft, Call of Duty, and Wii Sports, which, when doing this, I wound, found out that Wii Sports is, like, amazingly sold and made so much money despite, like, the simplicity of it. I thought it was free <laughs> for the longest time. But I, I also don't know. had, I had, like, the first Wii, and I it's thought a, we It's got a, it one of the free. highest grossing franchises games. It's freaking, there's, yeah. Uh, it's also the 14th, at least from what I found, the 14th, according to this year, saying the 14th highest grossing franchise. Once again, considering the list that were ahead of them, it's actually more, it's actually gross more than Halo. That's really surprising. The games that beat it, as far as time-wise, literally just Wii Sports and Call of Duty. As far as games like other games, it's literally like Mario, Tetris, uh, you know, Fast Final Fantasy, Need for Speed, uh, I mean, even Grand Theft Auto. All these games that have been out since like the 80s and 90s. I also feel like, for the most part, too, like, at least my take on, like, kind of, like, hearing that list, like, it doesn't, I guess, other than Final Fantasy, a lot a lot of those feel like casual games that you pick up for couch co-op and, like, are super easy to play. I mean, they're obviously, like, good fran- franchises, like Mario and stuff. Like, not only are they long, but they're also something that, like, anybody can pick up, whereas, like, the fact that, like, just listening to me and Adrian talk where it's like, this is a game that's really hard to get into because of how big this world is. Like, to know that it's still sold that much with as complicated as their mythos is, like, knowing that it's hard to jump in, like, at the end. Like, that's really interesting. Funny thing about this was there's actually three sports uh, franchises on that list. Does anybody want to take a guess at the three? I'm sure you can guess two of them. I know them because you told me them last night. <laughs> Uh, 2K. Nope. Madden. Madden's correct. Uh, NCAA? Nope. I don't know. One of the baseball games? Nope. NHL? Nope. Pro Evo, right? FIFA. Is one FIFA, of them? FIFA's, FIFA's, it basically goes Madden, FIFA, and then you have Pro Evo, which is also a soccer game. Pro Evo. I never heard of that. Yeah. I always know. I'm I surprised 2K's knew. not on there. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised Pro Evo is on. Except it's called it's basically short called PES now. P E P E S. So Pro Evolution Soccer, I believe. Oh. I just remember it was old, like whenever it came out, like the people who wanted FIFA but didn't want to spend the money on FIFA brought Pro Evo because Pro Evo was always like ten dollars cheaper than FIFA at the yeah. at GameStop when I was working there. Yeah, but those are the three <laughs> sports franchises, and yeah, that's why it's on there. My thing that I thought about all that was the fact that it's, sold, it's outsold basically like Sonic. It's out in Halo and a few other games that yeah. were going to there. It's been a lot longer. Um, obviously, on the other side of the coin, they kind of did this whole, during the time frame as well, and mid, anybody that's played games in the mid-2000s know this whole, I've called it, and, I, and I've heard it's always called the basically the Call of Duty, I guess almost fatigue syndrome, or call it what basically Call of Duty did. Actually, technically what, it's Acti- what Activision does. What Activision did to every <laughs> single game that they own for this time period. They started just releasing games year after year after year to where obviously they got to the point where they released two games in a year. 
when this series originally came out, which is kind of goes back to the naming, it was designed to be somewhat of a trilogy, ending on 12-21-2012 to go along with this whole prophecy thing, which is why you have basically within yeah. that only the Assassin's Creed 1, 2, 3, despite the third one being the fifth game, which is kind of how they got that whole point. Yeah. Um, like I said, they start releasing games every year. Due to this, they added multiplayer in basically three of the games, or four of them, which ended up being a kind of a, basically a controversial thing somewhat, because people didn't really like it. It was didn't seem it seemed unnecessary. And they had no f- playable female characters. I, I don't care about any of that. It just sounds like a terrible idea. Like oh, it's no, like it, putting it sounds like putting multiplayer in Tomb Raider. Like oh, I that play, was bad. I play Tomb Raider to play by myself. I don't want to play with anybody else. Like I, I would play Assassin's Creed to play by myself. I don't want to play with anybody. I That's achievement weird. Achievement hunted so hard to get perfect on Tomb Raider when I got that that first reboot game, and then I saw that I had multiplayer achievements, and I was pissed, so angry. This is about the time when my uh, achievement. Um, session went down on the Xbox because I have a thousand of a thousand on the first two and the only ones I'm missing on the last ones are basically multiplayer ones but yeah but yeah so they added multiplayer aspect it was kind of the first two games it was pretty bad like Adrian said it was kind of like a joke it was thrown in there they kind of kept and then this whole point they kept trying to expand on it and prove it and prove it and prove it and within this time it was kind of like the story telling seemed to go bad because obviously you had to split time and development between multiplayer and single player so that was kind of big gripe. After Black Flag, they got rid of it, which you think would be cool, but then it turned into this whole like rushing of games and became into bugs and unfinished, developed, horrible games, which Unity. led to Rogue, Unity, and Syndicate. Unity was released on the Xbox One was so bad, they literally had to halt. It was basically broken when they released. They had to basically halt the sale of season passes, which EA does, or, or Ubisoft, and uh, well, EA does too, but Ubisoft yeah. and a lot of other game companies do. To do this, they basically had to compensate people with free DLCs, and a lot of people, they gave even a choice of an older game with this. They also gave players the option of giving one of the free spinoff games, as like we kind of mentioned, but they had to give up the rights to sue the company because everybody formed this giant lawsuit, and there were multiple lawsuits trying for them to sue it because the game was literally broken. It was so bad. And so basically Ubisoft had to come out, and that's when they didn't announce really any future Assassin's Creed games. They kind of halted things until they fixed Unity, Apparently, within this time, they basically released Syndicate a little afterwards in a year. The sales weren't great on that. They obviously diminished, and then they basically put the franchise on hold. I didn't even know Rogue and Syndicate existed, in all honesty. Yeah. So, obviously a thing. Another thing was kind of like we... I mean, I guess Adrian and Kay talked about the stealthness and didn't like it, but the gameplay of the time was very... I mean, it was novel of the time. Basically, I guess... But. Well, I was going to say, like, the cool thing that I did like about it, and I think why I was able to run around freaking Renaissance Italy for so long, was because as much as it is a stealth game, like, I suck at sneaking, like, really bad if you play any game with me and I have to, like, sneak through things. Like, I was, like, uh, we were doing those Thieves Guild missions in mm-hmm. Elder Scrolls, and it was just, it was so bad. Why Kate wants to be rogues in every game, I have no idea. I am tanks now, Adrian. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I suck at it, but what I liked about Assassin's Creed was it wasn't a pure sneak game. It was, like, I had a lot of fun just running around on the rooftops <laughs> after I got caught sneaking. I mean, like, obviously, like, that part gets repetitive when you get caught enough, but it was actually cool that you did have an option to, like, not just sneak, okay, it's over, restart the entire mission, and then just have to, like, rinse and repeat that over and over yeah. again, which is why I don't play sneak games. So when the first game came out, like I said, the concept of Prince of Persian, as you guys talked about, almost this parkour thing. Obviously, it was open world parkour thing, which was pretty cool the way they did it. They had the stealth act, um, uh, aspect as well. Within the first two games, I believe as much as the stealth thing was good, it wasn't like played on as much. So you were able to play and get yeah. through that stuff. They have obviously the difference between you walk and they had these active versus passive abilities where you could walk through crowds and kind of like slowly bang, be, as I say, stealth versus, you know, start killing people. And then basically Leap of Face, as I like to put, became something of amazement for like pretty much anybody who's ever played this game or seen one. 
like they were just so much fun to do the development and the, the basically how much they put into the cities you could totally see and just the way it was actually one of the fan but why those we got on our twitter um was the architecture um like that was there that that was why assassin's creed was great to them was just the architecture itself yeah. in no, the just cities watching these basically if you don't know what it is basically you get to a high point of building you jump off like a leap of faith and you'd land in a bale of hay pretty much you always wouldn't die. It was totally, the goal was to try to get as high as you could because you kind of did a flip, and if you got high enough, you would just sit there floating backwards because it didn't look as natural because you were too high up. But they were just something of a, awesome. Did they steal that from Ultimate Spider-Man, the video game? Um, I don't because know. Because you used to be able to do that in Spider-Man. You just go to like the Empire State Building, and then you just jump off, and then it just like looks cool while you're falling down. That's what exactly what that sounds like. What game? When did this game come out? I'm it, it up. What came out first? 2005 was Ultimate Spider-Man, the video game. You don't remember doing that, Matt? Like going to the Empire State Building and just jumping off, and then just like having everything rush by you. Yeah, I mean, I do remember that, but in I, their defense, I feel like that's just how you fall when you fall from that type of height. <laughs> 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 like, it's the same reason why people fall into water all the same way. I really uh, that doesn't have to go. That doesn't have to go in the episode. I just thought it was kind of sketchy. I'm no, I'm just fine. Out by it. I just know the way. That, like I said I understand that. I just know what they did with it compared to like Ultimate Spider-Man. I'm pretty sure. Like you literally went there to unlock map, part of the map, to be able to see the. Because wasn't it? Wouldn't you have to like? You'd have to go up to those different high points for like the Eagle's Nest to unlock yeah. different parts, right? So you could yeah, see so they, where basically it's was. a vantage point. You would go. They would show the entire city in a background montage, and then basically you would jump off to complete yeah. it. Which actually, I'm really salty that they didn't have Fast Bender actually like go into a bale of hay because they they cut those yeah. leaps of faith before anything was done, and that yeah. made me kind of mad. As we talked about the storytelling, at least as I thought in the first five games, at least from the combine of both of them were really great. And the other games, I've heard like I said, Black Flag, the actual anim- the assassin storyline, not I mean, pretty good. But just the way they interact and the complexity they made with all the mythology and the lore they have. Yeah, and the, and it's really diverse. Like I looked up a list of the assassins. Um, like there, there's an assassin in India. There's an assassin from China. There's an assassin from Russia. There's at, there's assassins from Trinidad, who were former slaves. Like there's like Irish American assassins. Like there is a whole bunch of different. But aren't you here. always just playing the white guy? Huh? I don't think you're actually a white guy the entire time. But, like, isn't, like, the main person that before you go into the... Desmond oh, is. I, no, I don't think he's even white. Is Connor though. a white guy? Hold on. Connor is half Native American. Yeah. His mom's Connor's Native. Native. His mom's Native American, and his uh, dad is not. Dad's actually a Templar, I believe. He's modeled after Francisco Grandes. Uh, not sure... Oh, there is a no hood. I think I would just see these dudes with no hood, and all I see is, like, light skin, so I just assume all these dudes are white. Yeah, no, well, like, I, I mean, I, they might be somewhat light skin, but they're definitely, I guess, they're... It's well, also important, like, I guess it's also hard to remember, too, that, like... Where are the black of, assassins? There are, where are the black assassins, There are black it. assassins. Do I get to play as him? I don't know. Yeah, no, oh. it, it's in one of the spinoff games, I think. Yeah, which... Yeah, it's Assassin's Creed, Freedom City. He's also in Black Flag, and then in Assassin's Creed Rogue. He's in all of these, oh. and he's from Trinidad. Nice. And yeah, and then there's also an Assassin's Creed. There's an assassin from China. There's Assassin's Creed Chronicles India, where the entire game is just playing as Arbaz Mir, who's the an Indian assassin from during the Sikh Empire. So like, there is a lot of diversity here. One, two, three, four, seven, eight white assassins if you count Fastbender, and one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, uh, eighteen overall. So it's a split. Yeah. And when I and and honestly, when I say white, I mean like they're British dudes, I guess. <laughs> Because someone might have white skin, but they're, like, Italian. But even then, too, like, Irish-American was technically not considered white at the time that this was happening. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It depends on if you're going straight off color of skin, they're probably more. But if you're going like by yeah. actual ethnicity, then they're probably not that many. Yeah, which is like it. It's the same reason why like uh, I don't I don't know. Like there's a lot of light skinned Latinos too, so it's kind of. Like, I mean, to me, it's always looked at, especially the way they portray all these characters, has been like basically where they're from and like how like said whether they're Italian or whether like, they're British. Well, or whether that's, they're... I think like the cool thing here is that when they represent history, they're choosing a lot of different characters to, to represent history. Like they could have easily chosen some white dude fighting in the crusades to be an assassin but they chose an arab you so. play throughout the entire like your main cities is basically jerusalem damascus and i can't remember the last yeah one. well that's what i'm saying like it would like the easy choice would would have been to go with like the british and stuff but they didn't so i think that's i guess important. my bigger question is the subjects who are going like back in a time and doing these so things. are those white dudes so one you don't it seems like those are majority white dudes who are going back and playing as so african guy from so i don't that, know that, that's what i meant not like the assassins aren't like ethnic and like diverse because they obviously are but like it seems like it's just a bunch of conspiracy white dudes going <laughs> back into time and playing as native american guy to go save the world so as far that as sounds up, <laughs> it's a little racist. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's a good point. it's a little racist. Well, like okay, they couldn't so go get like an actual one, Native American subject. The other games, I can't tell you who it is, and at the end, you don't even be a person. But as far as the two people you do know of, because subjects one through fifteen, I don't remember. They don't tell you a name. You don't know anything other than they're pretty much dead. Desmond, like I said, he looks like skin, but he's literally Italian. I'm pretty sure. Uh, That's white. And he's raised... Actually, he's yeah, Canadian. So, yeah, so he's based off of Francisco Randez, and he has Hispanic ancestry, but is notably French-Canadian. Oh, yeah. French-Canadian, he's white. Well, technically, white Spaniards are white, but... Yeah, those white dudes. Clay, I think, is white. Clay, yeah. I do, but I'm not 100% sure. But I sure. also think, too, like we, o- we get one main character, and then we get one other... White guy going to role play as God. That sounds really bad when you say it that way. <laughs> That's how. I'm not gonna lie. You went through the whole history. I'm just like these are just a bunch of white dudes going back and playing as. It, it, it feels weird. It feels like some Westworld weird stuff going on here. That's what this. It feels like. It feels like Westworld. Like these people are just going to like party with. <laughs> like. The Native yeah. Americans. I, said, I can't remember what, what exactly like. what Clay looks like, but Desmond, at least in the game, never, at least to me, never looked like a like an actual like white person. It just seems like other white dudes trying to save other, stop other white dudes from doing bad stuff by going into. Um, if, to be fair, people. to be fair, the Templars kind of do with the whole Christian thing and kind of do the whole like everything else. So I could totally oh, see. So it's religious white, people. religious white people. Seems like it, but then I also don't think like it because I actually think like you. Sp- so far as representation is who you play on the screen, like, you are a white dude playing this character, but you are learning the life and exploring the lives of these other characters. At least to me, I mean, I, I don't know cool. about shades as far as color skin, but Desmond never acted like a freaking white person, was never a like, <laughs> never like a white person at all. Like did he person. run the other way when a killer came at him? Because if he did, he was not white. No, he did not run out. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, but also 90% of the game you spend playing within the Assassin, not okay. the other stuff. Moving on to the next but why, though, that apparently I probably should have put earlier in the show, because everybody brought it up and mentioned, was the actual <laughs> history and the usage of historical locations. I mean, in our defense, I was a history major, and Kate is like a graduate level person who does history and, and, like and for religions, her like degree and, and, and <laughs> in my defense if kate would have just let me talk that in a, the massive 10 minutes that i was going to do it we could have spent the whole time well i'm sorry that i was trying to make it not just be a chunk of you talking <laughs> i'm sorry for giving you my input it was called story time with matt because you were supposed to shut up and listen to the story <laughs> well you it's didn't like my song <laughs> So yeah, but the use of historical locations, events, and pe- people are like almost the foundation and one of these greatest parts of the series and why, despite like if you don't care about this Desmond story and all that backdraw, or you don't care about even like what kept the draw of the game besides just the gameplay that we talked about, was basically through all these spin-off games and all these um, other games that went past this whole storyline, 
they use actual historical people, locations, and events within history through everything. As we haven't really mentioned, but basically some of these spinoff games are like from India, China. I think they talk about, I think, freedom, which they talk about like liberation of some slaves, I believe, Mm -hmm. and some other, just other types of various regions of the world of these back things. And so they, like, as you said, you're but why, though, from somebody on Twitter, they essentially took historians and architecture people and basically digitized or basically made video game of these actual cities and what they actually look like during the time frame. So as far as I know, it's pretty authentic of what you see when you play. And it's why it has such great visuals of these cities and these places you go and it's such an immersive, like, open world to be in. And so they all basically, like I said, historical events. They talk about basically the Borgia's ruling. They talk about the Third Crusade and whatnot. They have, like, the American Revolution in here. Uh, They obviously use historical people. We kind of mentioned George Washington, and I mentioned Leonardo da Vinci, who plays a role. Leonardo da Vinci, they kind of hit everybody knows of the drawings. Obviously, they skew these around to be assassins or Templar, which makes this game even more fascinating. So they use all this history and historical information, and they kind of just sprinkle in this whole, I guess, overlay or backdrop of, like, conspiracy-type things and this whole entire, like, I guess, secret society war. Where like Leonardo da Vinci for the worked for the assassins and actually made a lot of those drawings and the of actually what you can find of like all his devices he would have made them for he was an Ezio inventor. yeah for Ezio and they worked to some degree <laughs> George Washington you know basically whether caught up or not basically nearly assassinated by Charles Lee who was a Templar who wanted to con- turn the thing out well in real historical manner like she said he basically wanted the actual spot. That George Washington took. He was basically he hated Washington. He was upset. He actually was apparently a drunk, from what Everybody I Everybody was a drunk back then, though. Yeah, <laughs> and so you know they talk about these Native American stuff going on, and then the Borgias, which been a while, but they talk about the institute, uh, not the institution, the, the Inqui- papacy. Yeah, the papacy, the Inquisition, and all that going on, and then they also talk about other historical events when they look for stuff within any things. I'm sure as you history people, if you played any, would be astounded on what they all do in the locations and time frame. And they all match pretty much almost time frame to time, uh, time frame, time frame, time wise to actual historical events, which is pretty cool. I can dig it. I know that they did say that they spent a lot of money bringing in historians and like actual people who like base their entire lives on all these time periods yeah no so basically uh the game you know they basically said that in the game (laughs) the funny thing is what the next part is the game actually starts in this is basically based on all historical events and things and people of various different backgrounds whether it be ethnicity or religious which is actually the next part which kind of goes with this itsu people in the ancient civilizations and this whole concept of Free world, free world, free will, this whole concept of basically free will versus the control of humanity. And basically these Itsu people, like I said, they're the ancient civilization before they basically made humanity, wrote their DNA, but obviously gave them only five senses instead of six, the sixth sense being knowledge, so they don't understand or comprehend these things. Um, They end up having a revolution to fight back, a solar flare wipes them out. And all these atoms or Apple of Edens or bases of atoms or even Eves basically come on the basis of the Adam and Eve story, where basically you take this apple, which can control humanity, or if you do if it's used in controlling of people versus in the fallen line and be obedient versus they do not use it, essentially you have free will. Um, it almost kind of ties in with funny thing of ancient because as these civilizations died off and become extinct after the solar flare, because obviously it didn't kill everybody, essentially humanity basically rises, and they actually live through it better, and they actually then start basically calling these people gods. And this is where you get your bases, as I mentioned, of all of their religions that come from is basically these actual Itsu people. Is that why their names are Juno, Minerva, and Jupiter? I believe so. Uh-huh. And so they, at least in my opinion, this game basically... And not really necessarily all out, but if you follow the complexity of the story and the way they do everything, kind of really just talks about how religion is nothing more than lack of knowledge and control of humanity and not basis upon anything other than lack of understanding. 
Yeah, no, I, I read up, I read a lot on the actual, I guess, like, religion, and I'm using, like, quotes here, religion of the assassins, and essentially, in order to be a, be an assassin, Matt mentioned it earlier, like, their whole thing is... Nothing is Yeah, true. nothing is true, everything is permitted. And the reason they have that is because they're extremely focused on spreading knowledge and doing the good doing the good of humanity through truth. And so for everything I saw, like that's what makes them an atheistic uh, an atheistic community. So the really cool thing here is essentially your good guys are atheistic assassins, which you don't necessarily think as the superhero type. Or not type, but, like, the, the type that, like, everybody plays into. Right. Because um, we're, oh, the way a lot of the people talk about atheists are that, like, we have no moral fiber. We don't know these things. And ultimately, what the assassins... They do kill a lot of people, though. They do kill a lot of people. <laughs> but the thing is, is, like, their entire basis of morality is doing what they need to do for the greater good. Yes. And always focusing on... On what is going to be what is going to be for the betterment of humanity, and at least from what I saw in the first couple of games, it's really it's really defined up against the religious idea, and they treat they re- they treat the religion itself as being a lie and an illusion, and to use the apple to get rid of free will, you're essentially creating a world of peace based on an illusion and based on a lie. Yes. And so for them, they want everybody to be educated and to be able to push back against this, which ultimately ends up being an, an ideological goal that they end up taking on as knowledge over faith. Um, and one of the really cool things that I was thinking about when I was doing all these readings was that at like the end like I know you said they kill a lot of people, but their main goal isn't to kill a lot of people. Right. Their main like their main goal is for the betterment of society. And so um one of the examples I saw on one of the articles was that they'll kill the person abusing his wife because it is better for humanity to have that person not be there, but they don't necessarily think for what the ramifications of that kill will do in the larger political scale, which is how they end up in a lot of these problems with the Templars. Yeah. Also, basically, this whole stealth concept of, <clears throat> like they said, they don't like to kill innocents, where if you actually played the game <clears throat> correctly, which you two apparently struggled with and so so like i thought that was really interesting because it, it's something that we don't we we don't get this i mean like they're obviously killers so i don't know if it's like positive atheist well it's funny because but... i mean like i said basically throughout this whole story their main allies are the poor the basically the the disenfranchised obviously and what's the main um the prostitute people what's their proper name for the renaissance prostitutes no they call them something else in the and then thieves, for the most Working part. Working women. I keep wanting to say, like, couriers or carriers. Oh, courtesans. Yes, there we go. So it's the poor courtesans and thieves. Yes, which are basically your main three, like, allies throughout this entire, like, first set of stuff. Yeah. And. Which I, I do know that Catholics hate this game. Not, like, if you're listening do. and you're Catholic, I apologize. Because you probably don't. But, they like, shit so on much Catholics as. So much. But so much as, like, the Catholic institution versus, like, act, I guess, like, practicing Catholics. But, like, the Catholic institution itself hates this game a lot. Um, as it did with the Golden Compass, because... It's also funny because a lot of the Templars are obviously depicted by a cross and other types of... Uh, yeah. Well, like, it, what they wear. Yeah, so, like, if you... Like, the actual, like, lore behind the Knights Templar, it's a Catholic organization. Yep. Like, in, I guess, a reality using quotes here but so but now that's one of the first aspects why i also uh, yeah obviously really enjoyed this storyline of the desmond thing more than so than so much of actually in the game just because of like all these other complex things and like i said this whole beginning of the human triple helix dna genetics we get evolution from these people from these ancient ancient civilizations they play into the 2012 prophecy and even kind of funny because it works into modern day of this power struggle. What do we have to start goes a mega mega corporation with a hidden agenda? Which I, I looked some stuff up on Abstergo, and apparently their like false company front is them being like a producer of something. So like they get people in. We're gonna make we're gonna we're gonna make 
we're going to make a story off of this character, so we need you to go in there and do it, and that that's, like, their entire front. Yeah, no, it's literally just of we're making a better world. Yeah. In some way. If, so. But, yeah, but, no, the, like I said, the whole back part I enjoyed so much and why I enjoyed the, the uh, original thing more than so. Well, do you think this new one's going to be good? So I mean, they've had two years to work on so, it, and it's in Egypt, which yeah. seems like it could be fun. So basically, Assassin's Creed Origin releases October twenty seventh. I said before, it takes place in Egypt, as Adrian said. They've had two years. I think overall, the game itself is going to be great, and I pre- I want. I think this game's actually going to be really good because at least from the previous stuff, when they have given time to actually produce things and not just this whole like we're going to throw out three games in a year. They've made some really good games. And the concept and the gameplay and the foundation they've built is just literally fantastic. Reason they can make, basically, we don't care about stories. You get to just go kill people, and it's so much fun. But also, I finally like, as Kate wants to talk on more of this whole Discovery Tour and how we talked about the history and what they've actually and finally embraced it in this game. Yeah, so, like, the main... Because I kind of mentioned in the beginning that, like, I'm... I am excited for this as the way it can be used in digital humanities to teach, um, like, college level and even, like, high school students history through video games. Like, the Discovery Tours essentially let you walk throughout Egypt and learn about Egypt's culture and learn about your entire surrounding. So, like, if you're in... um, if you're in a place where they're preparing a body and you click on the tools, well, it'll pop up an image from the Royal British Museum in Cairo and it'll have that picture of what they look like now and it'll give you an entire breakdown on what they're used for and everything like that. So it it's a really big learning tool and it's a really big way to embrace historical correctness while also letting you play through a storyline, which I think is really good because personally, that was what I liked from the other games was just running around in in them and in the worlds and, and learning more. And I think the fact that, like, I wouldn't necessarily say that I learned anything too much from the first games, but, like, this seems like an in, in immersed learning experience for all these things. So I want to say I did. I want to say I did learn things, but obviously it's been quite a few years since even Black Flag was released. So obviously, depending on thing. I just like how they finally embraced it. So as you said, the pop thing, they did have a lot of these like profile type things where they pop up on ancient people and they told you their life story and broke down and did all the thing. But they never like, I guess, like you said, fully embraced it to where it's it's like they show the gritty detail of everything. Because that's what I'm saying. Like learning about a person is like that. That brings me back to my Carmen San Diego game days. (laughs) Like that's cool, but actually being able to learn about the world that. Egyptians were living in at that time in all of its facets like that's pretty cool and the Egyptian character in here is dark skinned it's not a white Egyptian like it's mostly <laughs> do we know what like the storyline is Matt I mean it's called Assassin's Creed Origins so is it like <laughs> revamping stuff or... so as far as the actual storyline from what I found I'm not 100% sure what they're doing revamping and I mean I've obviously gone in depth because I'm kind of like, oh, with, with these games, kind of like how you are with spoilers, I don't like to read the whole story until I get in there. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And so, I don't know exactly what they're going to do. I'm okay with what they're going to... Like I said, I'm okay with this one. I think it's going to look cool and like the way they're doing things. Because, one, like I said, they took the time to actually develop. It's not a rush. We're going to throw it out here. Product. And I think I finally... Now that we did this episode, close the deal on I finished my Desmond prophecy thing and have to move on to continue the games. <laughs> <laughs> you had to give up on Desmond. Well, I just, like I said, when the game came out, and I guess I'll do it more in my final thoughts, but it was a, supposed to be a three game thing based upon the backdrop of this entire 2012 prophecy. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just hard to get into games that, that do that. And they learned that, hey, we can sell a lot of games as I put in this stuff of things, so we'll just keep making them. Yeah. And so, whatnot. Um, do you think any? Do any of you think you'll actually get it? I think that if you buy it, that technically means I buy it, and I have if, it at home to play. <laughs> if you buy it and you like it, I will take your suggestion because I trust your judgment. <laughs> yeah, I'm just really excited by, by about the world stuff. Um, oh yeah, and the dude is definitely dark, which is awesome. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
Bes- like I guess I mean I know Adrian mentioned it, but besides literally clay, which at the time I didn't even I I knew it was very diverse in thing, and like I said, you spend majority of your time in the Animus anyways. Yeah, I I think to me that's the biggest part is the fact that you're actually playing from characters who are on a side of history that may not always be the one that's being told. Yeah, which I think is interesting. And since I think it, I think this is Ptolemaic Egypt, which technically is the excuse for like. Uh, for Assassin's Creed Origins, like Ptolemaic Egypt is when you have Romans. Romans, yeah. Because you have Julius Caesar. Yes, yeah. Which, if this is Ptolemaic period, you're probably going to get Julius Caesar. I don't know if that's a spoiler for Matt or not. Yeah. But no, I, yeah, I, I assumed he was already been, in there It's somewhere. been history. Been, spoiler alert. Yeah. I assumed it was uh, Julius Caesar was either already in their lore or would eventually show up. But yeah, so like, yeah. It, like t- the Ptolemaic... Like, the Ptolemy line in Egypt is what people use to justify whitewashing, like, ancient Egyptian characters, because they were, it was a, it, they were, it, they, it was pretty much a mixed society at that point, um, so that, like, this could have been an easy out for them to say it's, it's Ptolemaic period, um, but they didn't do that. So. I think the other... Which I feel like is giving them a gold star for doing the bare minimum, but in a world where we don't get that, I'm just gonna say thank you, Ubisoft. So I think the other thing that I'm excited about, too, is... One, I kind of like Egyptian e- Egypt stuff, where I didn't really care about the French, the American Revolution. I guess I've heard so much of that sh- stuff that I just didn't care to play during the American Revolution so much, and the pirate stuff, and even moving forward, I think, I don't remember where you even go in some of them. I just, the scenery of where they were putting me did not seem to match, like, the first few games of yeah. being in Italy and being in Damascus and everything else. Yeah. And See. Egypt sounds like a very interesting place versus... Uh, yeah, yeah, Wikipedia's premise of the game kind of gives you a sense of like what it's going to be, like who you're kind of dealing with. Yeah. And yeah. So I mean, like I, I'm kind of excited, like just because I, one, I love Egypt in general. I but I don't like I didn't meet like I I know stuff about modern day Egypt, which is not ancient Egypt, completely different things. Um, but like I wasn't. I didn't finish playing one. I loved the world, but I didn't feel a need to keep finishing it. I also studied a crap ton on the Crusades in that era just because of, like, what I did. Um, but I really freaking love the Borgias. And so I think I'll really like them, and I hope you buy the game. Because then I buy the game. <laughs> By proxy. I'm going to lock the code to my <laughs> stuff. <laughs> my Xbox is your home one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'll probably pick it up. Um, I I like Egypt. I like ancient. If I wasn't a history major, I'd be, be an ancient history civilizations major. So, so I love ancient Egypt. Three PhDs. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> uh, I like ancient ancient Egypt. It's one of them, it's my mom's favorite. So I've always grown up with ancient Egypt. So I'm, I'm kind of I'm excited for it. Play it, Matt, so I can know if it's good or not. So our first Twitter. <laughs> Our first fan, but why they're from Twitter is from at flatter underscore you. Um, he's also the host of Holy Star Wars, which is a Star Wars and Religions podcast. Um, he says, where to even start? Few games have so much research put into them as they do. The landscapes are amazing. The gameplay was revolutionary and continues to push the open world action slash stealth genre harder and better than any franchise. Pirates. Tons of collectibles. While the plots are not always as great as I wish they were, the morals they struggle with are deep and important. Also, the overall lore. Oh, and I I also love AC Chronicles, the AC Chronicles titles, and so hope we get more someday. AC Origins is my one purchase this season besides Mario, and I've always found the this game was made by a diverse team, not only a legal thing but a statement of their ethics. Um, so, uh, the person who said architecture, by the way, is, um, at JNT podcasts, um, the just in time podcasts. Um, we also have one from Noel. Um, she's awesome. I was on her podcast, uh, Heil on life recently. So check out that interview. Um, and she is at Y F A O F M. And she says, the graphics are always amazing. I love how they weave his- historical events into their own fictional narrative. I love all the parkour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at Halloween Pod says, the mother of games. I lost many nights of my life to that original game. And if I started playing again, I won't be able to stop. And at 
WWT podcast says the game was okay, but the movie was abhorrent, which we didn't even talk about the movie. But. So basically, because these games became successful, they turned into a comic and a movie and some other and novels and novels. Yep. The movie they basic movie has nothing to do. It's just basically like a spinoff thing. It, it wasn't was a lot like a lot like World of Warcraft. It's five years too late. Yeah. Also, <laughs> true opinion. And it basically has nothing to do with the main. I don't know. I thought it was cool. It was all right. It wasn't great. It wasn't great, but it was cool. Sure. Uh, I like the a, good, fight scenes. a good video game movie has to like be with what's current and like what's going on in the games. If not, it's just like a movie with time traveling fastbender. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Yeah. But I also think I liked it because it was time traveling fastbender, <laughs> and I thought the, <laughs> I love fastbender, so that's totally my bias. Um, I I thought the fight scenes were really good, which for me, like, if I watch a movie like that, like I expect that. I was sad because I thought their high sci-fi was really convoluted and not high sci-fi, but, like, probably, like, B sci-fi. I give it a C minus. Like, C minus sci-fi? The movie is C minus. Oh. I yeah, I'd probably... I, I wouldn't watch it again. I I'd, watched it. I saw it. I'm over it. I'd watch Same. the fight scenes again. But I also... I'm known for liking bad movies, so... This is true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so who, what else we got, Matt? I have it right here. Um, here. So I have but why, though, from basically at the dopest QBZ on, from our Twitter. Lovely name. Uh, he says, basically, my first experience playing Assassin's Creed was one of amazement. I've never played a game that was so multifaceted. Between the sneaking... The double air assassinations, brutal open conflict combos, amazing story, and sheer amount of history highlighted, which we didn't get to talk about. Side note: uh, talk about the actual gameplay and while they advanced throughout the years, it was a lot of fun to kill people, and they made it very interesting and somewhat brutal. Um, I knew within the first 15 minutes of playing that this was a game that no matter how many they put out, I was going to buy them, and I did. Unfortunately, after Black <laughs> Flag, the series took a dip and seemed more like a money grab. Gone were the development of characters of Ezio, Desmond, and I'm just going to say Connor. He wrote out the actual name. I, I, I'm going to say the actual name because he wrote the actual name. So Radun, Radun Hakadun. Sure. And Edward Kenaway. And then instead of, instead we were given boring, non-fulfilling characters and storylines. I wish they would have taken a couple years off to develop a different, different avenues instead of just cranking these games out every, every year, i.e. GTA. I think this is some pretty cool fan, but why those? And I think we answered them. Well, not answered them, because they were them, but, like, we tapped into them. I think for the most part we did. Yeah. Obviously, there's only so much we can fit in an hour, and I didn't feel like editing another two-part episode. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, final thoughts? I assumed I was going to go last since I Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I guess, like, my final thoughts are I really appreciate the history. I will probably play the game. I, I I said I hope Matt buys it, so I have it. I'll probably buy it for him as a present and then play it myself. So that's probably where we're going to be at. Um, and we can do a review on it because we've only been doing movie reviews. I think overall the mythology is just... I, I want to go... Like I have... Or we have all the games, so I kind of want to go back and try to play. I don't know if I actually will, but just trying to learn that myth that mythology is probably like at the top of it because like I, I spent two hours reading about the isu i spent a crap ton of time looking up like the religion of the assassins and how they play in and i actually know people who wrote um like journal articles and stuff on how assassin's creed um interprets historical fact and how it actually does a really good job of presenting um like religious realities in those time periods and how it can be a good teaching tool. Um, so that kind of, that shows you the kind of work, the type of work that went into the history. Um, yeah, that's my final thought. History. Uh, for me, I think I'll probably play this one. One, because the more like I'm reading on it um, and the more I look into it, it does kind of seem, you know, as the name implies, a, a kind, of, kind of an origin thing. So I don't think I need to know all of the, stuff to understand the game like all of the history that we just went through not that i wouldn't be able to because matt did a wonderful job of explaining it all 
but it looks pretty good. I mean, the guy's name is like Bayek, and if I'm remembering from my mom's old Egyptian book, it's like Bird or something. And there's like feathers in the game. There's so always feathers your... game in the game. Yeah, so you might get some stuff like where the feathers came from. So I might be persuaded to play the games after. I highly doubt it. But <laughs> this one seems like a good like this seems like a good one that, for them to kind of get back into. Like I said, I like history. I like Egypt, so this is a good starting point for me. I don't know if I'd ever go play like the American Revolution because <laughs> it doesn't sound very fun to me. But this. But this this one sounds fun. They've taken I guess three years now I guess since they started doing it in what like brother like after Black Flag. Uh, so no, they started. Well, this one came after Syndication, which was released in twenty fifteen Syndic- or Syndicate. My bad. Was yeah, but like you think like you have to think like development. Like they started Devel- probably developing this maybe in probably twenty fourteen. I'd imagine. Yeah, somewhere. Well, I want to yeah. say that, but I'm not one hundred percent sure just because of all the problems they had with the Unity stuff. So I couldn't tell yeah. you. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's ta- they've taken a couple of years off to like do this. Like one of the fan, but why those said, like if they should have taken a couple of years off and then kept going. I think this is the a good direction for them. Um, and if I could just kill people and still progress through the game without having to sneak, I'm I'm down. <laughs> and if I could like be it, like if I can warg into like an eagle. I'm also down. <laughs> that sounds fun. So one, it was actually fun and interesting that you guys talked about the sneak thing. So the first few games, it wasn't as much, but then as the game progressed and far, they added more sneak aspect where you got to the whole point where you couldn't be caught or you would fail, which is probably why, could be a reason why you guys end up having trouble towards the end. But anyways, I guess from my final thought, um, obviously I love the series up to where before they... Call of Duty this thing, which eventually might have an episode on that in the entire mid-2000s, what they did or Activision is famously known for. Um, the story pillin, the history that everybody talked about was great. The I guess the graphics are actually in the way the architecture of the actual game for fun. It was just fun gameplay in general. But as far as what immersed me in games and why we want to do this episode, like I said, it's because it's original story that involves so many aspects of not only history context of learning things and historical characters and events, but this conspiracy type background thing of like this ancient civilization, these prophecies. I did enjoy the fact that most of the concepts of this game bash religion in, in general, which was probably, especially during that time frame of my life, would have been a lot more on high on the list. <laughs> But I just thought it was well done and well thought out and definitely something that if anybody wants to something should play at least those five games to get a great series. And they sell them in bundles now, so it's super easy. Yes, it's true, they do. And I'm kind of excited for Origins because, one, they took their time, like Adrian said, and it kind of seemed like it reset everything to where they kind of got, I don't know if they went away totally, but they did get away with all this whole like last few parts, and they're going to reset everything. So it seems like it could be quite something where you could get another three or four games out of it with a brand new storyline. And I just don't care about playing American Revolution or anything. That's how I feel about the French Revolution. I hate anything I think anything you play in the French Revolution in you Rogue. Do. Yeah, yeah you know, no, I hate, I, hate, I hate anything involving the French, the French Revolution. It's just so annoying. And if you ever do get a chance, you should go and actually read some of these, like, hate said, some of the stuff. Just because the lore is so well, I mean, obviously it's just people, but it's so well done, so interesting. I mean, you find these pieces of uh, Eden get throughout their history in Apples, where they go to, like, Tesla, Benjamin Franklin, JFK, assassinations, uh, Napoleon, everything, all why they did it. And it's all throughout the games that's basically been written out, so you don't have to play the games and study it all. But that would probably be my final thoughts. Awesome. So if you heard your fan, but why though, I will be putting them up on the website when I put this on air. So you can check them out there. But why though podcast.com. If you want to know a little bit more about me, I did three interviews recently. So I did one with um, Dan Whitehodge of Whitehodge Podcasts. I did one with uh, Noel Heil from Heil on Life. And Matt and I did one with Mixter Hyde um, and the Into the Mix podcast. So go check those out. Um, there's some pretty cool people and you can get, a, get to know a little bit more about us. And as always, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Oh My Mithrandir. Adrian? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. At Super Reese 93, S U P E R R U I Z 93. But don't send him any DMs because he's a married man now. 
Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. When does this episode come out? Doesn't this come out the week the week of my this the week of my wedding? This comes out. He won't be married yet. Oh no, he won't. Never mind. It comes out the week, right? The week of. Yeah, yes. it comes the week of. The eleventh. The eleventh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can follow me on Twitter and see all of my hashtags for the Phantom Marriage on the fourteenth when we're, I'm getting married. Follow me on social media for that. Matt. And you can find me on the Twitter at dat m eighteen d a t t m one eight. Okay. Bye. 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 Oh shit.